Richardson and I thank you so much for looking at this video. Um, we just think that uh, in this particular time, uh, it is just critically important as we speak about pre-tribulation rapture, uh, devastating end time dogma. So, uh, in so doing, we want to do it uh, in very short order and give you an opportunity to study yourself uh, with this particular topic. We understand that in conservative theology, that pre-tribulation rapture uh, has been the vanguard, as it were, uh, certainly in the Protestant movement. Uh, we recognize that. Uh, but we also uh, have to be able to continue to explore Scripture. By the way, we want to be very clear here. There's no question about whether or not rapture will take place. The issue is when it will take place. And there's plenty of people, you know, all over the place. In fact, uh, from a historical standpoint, for myself personally, uh, I, I certainly, there's plenty about me uh, on all of the APCs, Christ Space um, websites that you can go see. There are plenty of news release, press releases about my background and what have you. Uh, but I began on, on this particular topic um, uh, in the early 70s, Hal Lindsey's uh, very pop uh, books, basically, uh, Late Great Planet Earth, uh, and then the book following that. And then I had a chance uh, in my first, um, which we call a scholarly study as a student at Simpson College, pr presently uh, in, uh, it was in San Francisco at that time in the 70s, it's so now in Redding, California. Simpson uh, University, uh, but my first real um, formal document that I wrote about in Times uh, had this very argument in it, and uh, I had George Ladd Fuller Seminary on one side in terms of a resource, and then uh, John Wolver, uh, Dallas Theological Seminary Verse, both outstanding scholars, and that's when I discovered uh, at that particular time through that study, I mean, my bottom line, they, they seem to both have uh, very um, uh, highly valued arguments without any question, one being pre-tribulation, one being post, uh, yeah, pre-tribulation uh, rapture, one being post-tribulation tribulation rapture, or at least after uh, or during the, uh, the uh, tribulation period. And so I just came to the point that no man knows the question aloud. That was really my conclusion in my first document uh, over 40 years, nearly 40 years ago. And I've always stayed with that. So I always knew, even though, you know, the conservative theology and, um, you know, the churches that I belong to, even though pre-tribulation rapture was always, um, you know, the, 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 the standard, as it were. But I always knew uh, from that time on, studying myself in that way and looking at the pros and cons, that we just had to be ready. And so now here we are, uh, years later. Uh, and, I, of course, just like anybody else, any student or any ministry professional or persons uh, who grow and develop in their knowledge uh, of, a, of any particular knowledge base, and particularly Scripture, of course, I know exponentially more, uh, have written about Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, you can go see that on CB Live Bible Commentary. My notes are there online for anyone to see. Um, and so now uh, I've come to that point where I'm at another place. Um, uh, I'm more uh, adamant that tribulation is not a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, several of the arguments are that, you know, that the believers will not be uh, subject to the wrath of God. Well, uh, when we start talking about persecution, believers have been persecuted since the first century. Uh, that's not the wrath of God. We know that. Um, and so there are a number of arguments along that line, and, and we get it. But now we want to, in just a few minutes here, lay out why uh, we think it's so devastating to be dogmatic about a pre-tribulation rapture. Anybody, pre-tribulation rapture, anybody teaching about rapture uh, has to be open uh, to the whole, um, to a number of things uh, concerning, as far as particularly concerning time and tribulation, and particularly the great tribulation, you have to be open. Uh, and we're going to lay that out for you right now so that you can see exactly what we're talking about. Let's first talk about the fact that uh, the field of eschatology, after the Protestant movement of the you know, 15th, 16th century, you know, Martin Luther, we've heard about him, John Calvin, we've heard about him, all of these persons were early 
theologians and the Protestant movement, there had to be a rediscovery of what we, you know, commonly uh, call uh, anything practically in the Protestant movement. Because just remember, in Catholicism, it was all held in clergy. And uh, there are some things that they came to agreement on. Uh, salvation, uh, grace, and by agreement I mean the Calvins, the Martin Luthers, and that, that particular age and that type of uh, uh, time frame. Uh, so the center, the core of the faith, you know, uh, they came to um, agreement upon. But then uh, later, things like uh, epistemology, uh, Christian ed, counseling, uh, the operation of the Holy Spirit, uh, and of course, evangelism and eschatology, those would develop. They're less than 500 years old. And what we're saying here is that, you know, we understand when we're looking at what transpired in Scripture, there is the thing that is the principle that's called the imminent return of Christ. Well, we get it. You know, uh, well, why would people call it the imminent return? It was because, you know, when you're looking at him um, and you look at what he says in terms of Matthew 24 uh, and other places uh, uh, consistent with Matthew 24 and, and Mark and Luke, um, his whole thing is being ready for believers to be ready. Remember I said in my original document, I read, you know, no man knows the uh, day or the hour. And so we understand that, that. That, 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 the, that the church at that time, uh, in the first century, they had this sense of this imminent return, okay? All right? Uh, Paul gives clarity, all right? Because revelation is something that unfolds over time. It's not like you get the whole picture at one time. You get the, it's almost like a puzzle that you have to construct. And we know that, you know, end time books are throughout the Old Testament. Practically, something said about the, about the end times, just as with Jesus, throughout every book in the Old Testament. And then, of course, it's, it's culminated, as it were, in the New Testament. But the major books is Daniel, like Daniel 7, Zechariah. Uh, of course, you're going to have Matthew 24. You're going to have Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, Thessalonians chapter 2, 2, you know, that we'll get into. And, of course, it's all culminated in Revelation. So we want to say, so we're saying here that you have to put the whole thing together. And then when you get the knowledge base of this information, you, you then have to change your view based upon getting a clearer, clearer view of everything that's transpiring, okay? So, so Paul gives us this clarity as we get to 1 Thessalonians. Now, interesting enough, Jesus did mention something that could be, that could be construed or, or interpreted as, as, as rapture. Because people say, well, Jesus didn't say anything about rapture. Well, he did. He just used a different term. We get to Paul. Paul gives the clarity. Believers are dying. We're in 1 Thessalonians 4, and they have a great concern. So he begins to write, and he tells them, you know, they're being persecuted. They're beginning to die. They're waiting. It's been told, be ready, that the Lord could come anytime. So he gives some clarity. There's going to be a rapture. Um, believers are dying. They'll be caught in the air uh, with those who have died in Christ. Okay? So let's keep that. He gets to 2 Thessalonians, he gives even more clarity because now it's like, well, when is this stuff going to happen? So 2 Thessalonians 2 begins, well, first there's going to be this great falling away. And then the appearance of the man of lawlessness, okay? All right, that's, so we're kind of giving you the background as we go here. So like we said, all prophecy, it develops over time. Now, in the chronology of books as they're written, the final books are the epistles of John and the book of Revelation. And I submit to you that when these books were written, particularly Revelation, it should have corrected any thinking or thoughts that believers had about when Jesus would return. Does G, do we, did it mean that it canceled out what he said? No. But it just gives perspective to what Jesus said. Okay? Jesus says, be ready, Matthew 24, all of these things are going to transpire. Then Revelation comes and helps to give some perspective to that, all right? Revelation helps to give perspective to what Paul has said, okay? So that we can, so that uh, we're, we're not misunderstanding. There are certain things that have got to happen first. They have to transpire first, all right? So here comes uh, Revelations. And one of the, uh, of the many things that's said there. The one that we want to uh, exercise here 
uh, in making our point about, about uh, pre-tribulation rapture being a devastating doctrine, we want to uh, highlight this particular experience in the book of Revelation. This is in chapter 6. Now, uh, I, I do have to back up just a little. Um, I am one of all people that says when you're going to learn from Scripture, teach books. All right, teach books. If you're going to learn to just be discipled and develop as a believer, teach whole books. Don't just pick verses or what have you. Eschatology, you can read a whole book, but it happens to be one of those books where you do have to study, place the puzzle together, the revelation of God together, and then try to come up with a conclusion, and that's what we're doing now. But for all intents and purposes, we typically study from a book, try to get points from a book, from major passages from a book. We might get references, but we study from a major book, so we're not getting the scriptures to say what we want to say. But eschatology is a bit different. Yeah, you can read the whole book of Revelation, but you need to know the sum total of all scripture and bring it into play, and that's what we're doing here. So as we continue, Matthew, uh, Revelation 6, there is an experience where the saints are asking when they will be avenged. All right, and the response to them is for them to rest until the remainder of the martyrs also uh, return, until the remainder of the, to the martyrdom is completed. So you've got these saints who are asking. Now they're in a place where they can communicate. But the fact that the term under the altar or beneath the altar indicates in our view that they're not absolutely there in what Paul called the third heaven. They are in a place where they can communicate, but they are not there in the third heaven. They're not in any anguish. They're not in any, any pain or anything of that nature. But they are looking for the day when they will be avenged. And their answer is to wait until everybody, all of the martyrs, are in. So, all right, so where are these people if this is the particular situation? Well, recall that, um, that when Jesus dies, all right, all of the saints before him, they are in a place called Hades. You could also refer to it as hell, all right? And remember the terms of the book of Psalm and Ephesians, that he goes and takes captivity captive. He goes and rescues them from this place called Hades, that is under satanic authority. Remember, when you get to the lake of fire, hell, is, hell itself uh, is going to be thrown in the lake of fire. Hell is not the final abode, or Hades is not the final abode. But it is chains of darkness that Satan has under his authority. Jesus, when he dies, he goes there and takes captivity captive. All right? All right, he takes them captive. That's in Psalms, and as Paul just refers to Psalms when he's in the book of Ephesians. Now, where do they go? Where do these saints, the Davids and the Moses and the rest of them go? Do they go to the third heaven? No, they don't go to the third heaven. They can't yet. They're not prepared yet. It's not time yet. Okay, so where do they go? Remember Jesus on the cross in the book of Luke. Uh, remember there's the one thief who admits, we've done what we've done, but this man has done nothing. And remember, looking upon Jesus, he asks, will you remember me? And Jesus tells him, this day you will be in paradise. The word paradise is like parable. Anytime you see para, it is like something at the side of something. It's not the thing, but it's at the side of it. And dice is almost like a part, like Era, a park at the side, a place of beauty at the side. Now, people talk about, you know, the different heavens. Paul was called up to the third heaven. Remember that? And so people say, well, what are the first and the second and the third? Well, I believe that the first heaven is, is this, this the earth, the skies, and into space. Now, some people believe that space is the second heaven, but I don't. I believe that the second heaven is the paradise that Jesus is talking about where the saints of God go who are um, who are who have been taken captive, captive by Jesus and placed in this place of extraordinary rest, waiting for the resurrection of all saints. All right. Now, that's a that's a term. Watch this. Resurrection and rapture is the same thing. OK. All right. It had the rapture hasn't taken place yet, but they are there. And like this thief, 
He also is going to be there, those who believe, because Jesus has gone down to hell, brought all the saints up, and they are in this place. They are the same ones who are asking when will we be avenged, particularly those who were killed, who were martyred for the sake of God. And he is telling them rest. But like I said, they are under the altar in Revelation chapter 3, meaning they're not in the third heaven. In our view, they're in the second heaven. Okay? And again, these persons, these saints have not been translated yet. Now by translated, remember John says, all that we know is that when we see him, we shall be like he is. Paul says in 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, there about, we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And all of that has not transpired with the saints who have died, all right, before Christ, and all of the saints who have died since Jesus has died, and they have not quite yet been called up in the air, as Paul said, and changed in the twinkling of an eye. That has not happened quite yet. Now, so we get to Revelation chapter 13 and 14. Of course, Revelation chapter 13, that's where you've got the dragon and the beast and the introduction uh, of the, um, uh, the 666, uh, the combination of commerce, religious leader, uh, military leader, and like I said, in commerce, and the complete control all of, over all the earth. And in chapters 13 and 14, and of course, and it says in 13 and 14, he overcomes the saints. It says the, uh, that, that the power of the unholy trinity, particularly the lawless one, overcomes the saints. And in 13 and 14, it says this is a time of faithfulness for the, for the saints to demonstrate faithfulness. Okay? They've got to do that. Now, some are killed. But it also appears that some are jailed and destitute as well during this particular period, okay? Now, almost like a movie that shows the end of a story. You've seen that before where there's a movie, it shows you the end. The plot is the end of a story. And then as it, it, it goes, begins to tell the story to, to sh demonstrate how this end happened. Well, we have the same kind of thing in Revelation. When we're looking at chapter 13 and 14, we already know how it's going to end because, you know, back in chapter 7, we've got an extraordinary scene. All right? There is a scene of 144,000. Okay? All right? In this extraordinary worship of God Almighty. There's 144,000. And it is the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, there are persons... Who believe that after who have a pre-tribulation thought or pre-tribulation position, they say that the Jews, once the church is taken out, then the Jews will take over and they're the ones who are being persecuted that we see here in chapter 13 and 14. Well, I beg to differ. I believe, yes, that the Jews do come to a place where they recognize that Jesus is the Messiah that they've been looking for, and that's represented in the 144,000. Whether you believe that's a precise number, or whether you believe that's a figurative number, but that is there in the seventh chapter. But then there is also a number of every nation, of every tongue, and it is innumerable. That is more than just the Jews. It's this incredible number who are, uh, uh, you know, as John is looking at it, he wants to know who are these. He saw the 144,000, but then he wants to know who are these. Every nun, every tongue, every nation. They, they are the ones who have, had, who have white robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. And the answer is, these are they who came out of the pressure, the great, the pressure, the mega. All right, and the pressure, the mega, is what we translate as the Great Tribulation. Now, it's very important here to understand that almost every one of the Bible versions, King James, uh, ESV, uh, New American Standard, Living Bible, almost every one of it has it correctly translated, ek, out of, out of the Great Tribulation. They were brought out of the Great Tribulation. 
Okay? Out of means they didn't go through. That's a different word in the Greek, a different preposition. They came out of, and every version of Scripture is consistent with this. These are they, this incredible number that came out of the great tribulation. How did they come out of the great tribulation, we ask? They came out of the great tribulation. These persons, remember we said 13 and 14, who have persevered. It's a time of faith. We believe they were brought out through tribulation. Tribul uh, excuse me, through rapture, through rapture, through the rapture. Through what Jesus calls, see some people said Jesus, uh, never talked about rapture. Remember when he was asked about this, this parable about marriage. And uh, the Pharisees were trying to trick him. And uh, they said to him, uh, gave him this silly uh, parable and illustration about this fella uh, dying and his brothers all married the wife. Well, they were trying to defeat uh, the principle of resurrection. And they said, okay, well, in heaven, uh, who's going to be her husband? Since she married all seven of these brothers, these other brothers. And he said, you know, you guys think you know the scriptures. You really don't know scripture because... In heaven, all right, we are no longer marrying or being married because what? We are, that is, being, we are in the angelic platform, what I call the angelic platform, okay? When, so we won't be marrying and giving in marriage, all right? And then he continues in that same parable by saying in the resurrection, there is no longer marrying or giving, there it is. In the rapture, when the everyone is when when the believers are raptured, the word for resurrection, raptures, raptures, resurrection, they won't be there. They're going to be in an angelic form, all right. What I call and in the Jesus configuration, angelic form, Jesus configuration. Okay, all right. So we can see now that what transpires. The rapture is not just something that's going to happen casually or haphazardly. It is going to be at a key moment in history, just like Noah's Ark, uh, just like the opening of the Red Sea, just like the banks of the river or the Jordan drying up right at the right time. When the believers are exhausted, they're going to be taken out when, it's going to, when it looks like they have lost. That's why third chapter 13 and 14 of Revelation says it is a time of faithfulness. Okay, that we would be faithful. We see ourselves dying. We see ourselves being jailed. We're seeing ourselves being destitute. But we're not to give up. We're going to be taken out through death and or by rapture. And ultimately when rapture happens, it will catch up everyone. Now, okay, so now when you see this scene where there are an innumerable, the, the, the number's not countable, okay, how could they be there? How could they be there at this time? It is because uh, the rapture has transpired, and as the scripture says, they've come through, or excuse me, they've come out of the great tribulation. All right? All right? Here's the other thing that we've got to, we've got to keep in mind. Right? So, we've already talked about the fact that there will be great masses falling away. Right? All right. Right today, this is that day when masses are falling away from the true faith. They may be still going to the church house. Uh, they may be still claiming they're Christians. This is the period where masses are falling away, and it is a period of great deception. All right. But when the believers start dying, it is going to be the greatest evangelistic instrument, winning more people to Christ than any time in church history. All right. There is a purpose in the persecution for us. Satan may be trying to wipe us out, but God is going to use it to win more people. When people see people willing to die, it is going to make huge numbers come. Well, how do we know that? The Revelation chapter 7. This incredible number does what? Comes out of tribulation. So right before tribulation, apostasy. During Tribulation, incredible evangelistic movement. So this is the reason. When we take the sum total of this, why it is so devastating to be teaching people that they're going to be raptured just at any particular moment, when now we know the whole story. We can understand folks saying that 
uh, before Revelation. But once Revelation was written, okay, then we should have clearly known better, you know, than the first century Christians who didn't have Revelation written quite yet and not canonized. We should have known better than continuing to hammer on this pre-tribulation rapture, all right, once we had the full revelation that God has provided. You could ask the question, well, why would we end up having pre-tribulation rapture? Well, I'm biased. I mean, I don't want to be here for persecution. But we have to remember, we were called, we're martyrs, all right? When the scripture says uh, in Acts uh, chapter 1, verse 8, all right, uh, you shall be my witnesses, that word for witnesses is martyrs. When Jesus said, you try to save your life, you lose it, but if you lose your life for my sake, this is part of the reason why we have such apostasy. People that since the 60s, principally, have come about with this just name Jesus and I'm in kind of understanding. When you read scripture, it is life-giving. There's two parts to it. You follow him, but the time is going to come when he is going to bring you face to face with the question, will you give your life to me? You have to give your life. And so the numbers that we have of people claiming are not the true numbers. So therefore, at this point in time, we have this extraordinary fall away. And when you place it with all of the other information that is happening, our technologies, the condition of the world, degradation of our faith, you know, our persons who claim the faith, the false rise of false prophets in extraordinary numbers, you can understand why the, the apostasy is in place. And we're waiting now for the unfolding of the lawless man, for the revealing of the lawless man. But the fact of this particular video is to share with people that persecution, we need to do what? We need to be preparing for persecution, hoping for rapture. We believe that that is the appropriate perspective and not simply to be dogmatic that at any moment we're going to be raptured. The full evidence of 2,000 years of history other scholars principally saying the same thing that I'm saying. And then the scripture itself overwhelmingly indicates that we need believers here who will be the ones who will demonstrate to all of the world that our God is the God because we're willing to be martyred. And that martyrdom is going to lead to the greatest movement of God of calling people to him that in the rest of all of church history combined. May God bless you. And keep. Amen. Oh, oh, oh.